Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Nolan, a Group Development Manager with Dawn Meets, and uh, it is my pleasure to moderate uh, today's debate uh, as part of the 2021 Great Agri Food Debate, and of course, our first virtually. Uh, I think I speak for everybody associated with this initiative, and thanks to McDonald's and Dawn for it, of course, uh, in its support for business leaders of the future. And I know that every year as it comes around, we tend to eagerly anticipate. And if I could draw the analogy of Cheltenham, we look at the entries, we study the form, we watch where the runners and riders are. And of course, we monitor their progress through the race. And at the end of the day, the wonderful thing about this great initiative is that it's winner all right for everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure and to welcome our judges today and indeed to thank them for volunteering. Uh, uh, we have six uh, for the debate this morning, and they are Brian Highland, Group Technical Director with Dawn Meats, Harriet Wilson, Agriculture Manager McDonald's, Wayne Anderson, Director of Food Science and Standards at uh, Food Safety Ireland, Sarah Hare, Agriculture, Head of Agriculture at Dawn Meats, Nicholas Safar, Chair of AHDB, and Glenn Shanley, Head of Corporate Banking at Ulster Bank. Uh, judges, you're all very welcome, as I said, uh, and we'd love you now just to introduce yourselves, if you don't mind. So perhaps we'd start with Brian Highland. Brian. Thanks, Paul. Uh, my name is Brian Highland. Um, I'm the, the Group Technical Director for Dawn Meats. Um, I look after all food safety, quality and animal welfare aspects of the business um, in both the, the Dunbia and Dawn Meats businesses. Um, I graduated from, from UCD with a food science degree in, in the late 90s and I spent a couple of years in the pork and bacon industry before joining Dawn Meats in July 2001 in the Balahadreen site in the west of Ireland as, as technical manager of the site. Over the next number of years, I, I progressed through the company and um, I've been in my current role for, for the last 10 years or so. Thank you very much, Brian. We look forward to hearing from you, uh, no doubt, as the competition emerges. Uh, Harriet Wilson, how are you this morning? Very well, thank you, Paul. Um, so my name is Harriet Wilson and I lead agriculture and sustainable sourcing topics for the McDonald's and UK, UK and Ireland business. Um, I previous so I joined McDonald's in July, um, and previous roles have been in retail with Aldi and with the co-op. And previous to that, I was a Harper Adams graduate, where I actually did my placement year with McDonald's. So it's a return to me. And then at home, we are beef and sheep farmers in Staffordshire in the West Midlands. Um, but really excited to be involved today. Thank you. Thanks, Harriet. You're really immersed in your brief in every sense of the word. Uh, and thirdly, we have Wayne Anderson from the Food Safety Authority in Ireland. Wayne, you're very welcome. Morning, Paul, and uh, thank you for the invite to judge this uh, debate. It's going to be very interesting. And good luck to all the students. I'm Wayne Anderson. I work for the Food Safety Authority of Ireland, uh, where I'm in charge of uh, science and risk assessment. Um, been there for the last 22 years, and uh, before that, I worked in uh, Leitrim Foods, and before that, for Unilever. Um, so I'm a graduate of Reading University and uh, of uh, Coventry University originally, and uh, I came over to Ireland in 1998, and uh, haven't uh, haven't left since. <laughs> Thank you, Wayne, and I'm sure you'll bring an international, obviously, standard to this in every sense of the word. Uh, uh, fourthly, we have Sarah Hare. Sarah is Head of Agriculture at Dawn Meats. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, Paul. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the invite to, to judge this year. I had the fortunate um, pleasure of uh, judging last year, too, and um, it's great to see um, so many young and enthusiastic people with so many great opinions and, and views on and current topics of the industry. So my name is Sarah Hare. I'm Head of Agriculture for the, the Door Meats Group. I've been with the group now nearly 11 years. Um, I chair the UK Cattle Sustainability Platform as well, and sustainability has been um, part of my role for the last um, eight or nine years, very much through and through. Um, I graduated from Harper Adams, like Harriet, um, uh, back in the day, um, and did a master's degree to, in food safety and quality. Um, I've also done a UK Nuffield scholarship as well, and I can wear a farmer hat as, at home um, with cattle and sheep too, to hopefully bring a broad brush to this debate. 
Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate that. Our fifth uh, judge today is Nicholas Saffer, chairman of AHDB. Nicholas, good morning and welcome. Hi, Paul, and thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Um, just by way of introduction, I'm, I'm a lawyer by training. I've been involved in the food industry for a long time. I built a public company um, farming in South America, Southern Africa, and, and Europe. I, um, I also started Food from Britain for the government, and, um, and I've chaired various industry organizations before I came to HDB. So I'm delighted to be part of this judging panel and to hear what is probably going to be one of the most important subjects for the future of agriculture. Here, here. Thank you very much, Nicholas. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce again, Glenn Shanley, Head of uh, Banking at Ulster Bank. Good morning to you, Glenn. Good morning, Paul, and it's it's great to be involved in the great agri-food debate again this year. Um, my name is Glenn Shanley. I head up corporate banking in Ulster Bank and have been involved in banking for the last 20 years. Uh, one of our most important sectors is obviously the food, agriculture and drink sector. So i um, delighted to be involved in this debate. It's key for us and one of the really uh, growing themes over the last number of years is that of climate change and sustainability and what banks can do with that and to that end I have personally just recently completed a course in climate change in University of Edinburgh and sustainability leadership in Cambridge so I'm looking forward to hearing the debates today and uh, learning more on the topic. Thank you very much, Glenn. So that's your six judges, ladies and gentlemen. Can I take this opportunity to thank all of them uh, for volunteering their time to participate in this? And isn't it wonderful that we have people with expertise in so many areas? And at the same time, when you put that jigsaw together, it is about the agri-food industry, which we're all so proud of. So thank you, judges. Uh, you will now go to your uh, meeting room and uh, we will proceed shortly with the debate. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, the time has arrived. The, an eagerly anticipated uh, debate now is ready to take place. It is my pleasure to introduce our two teams today. We have CAFRI, Northern Ireland's Agriculture, Food, Rural and Enterprise College. Welcome and Falcha to all of you guys. And for the very first time, participating from Britain, we have Aberystwyth University. Uh, and to you guys, I believe, Croiso, welcome. Uh, and I'd like to wish both teams all the best. Uh, you guys have put in incredible work in preparing for this. So please just remember to enjoy as well as compete as hard as you can uh, in the next hour or so. So our subject matter all week in the Great Agri debate, of course, is surrounded and focused in sustainability and its role in agriculture. And this morning's uh, debating topic is the livestock sector can meet the requirements of net zero. And proposing the proposition, we have Aberystwyth and opposing it, of course, Caffrey. So without further ado, I'm going to call on uh, Aberystwyth Captain Simon Longworth to open uh, with his remarks, please. Simon, you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Simon Longworth. I am a second year environmental science student with career interests in sustainable food systems. Uh, alongside me today in representing Aberystwyth University are fellow first and second year students, Elizabeth Preston, Lindsay Haynes, Oliver Stevens and Anthony Avis. Today, we are proposing the conviction that livestock production can and will meet net zero requirements by 2050 with our core focus relating to the environmental impacts associated with ruminant farming and grass-based systems, which are best suited to 65% of the UK farmlands and approximately 84% of utilised agricultural land in Ireland. At present, emissions from the livestock sector account for approximately 5% of the net total greenhouse gas emissions in the UK, significantly lower than the estimated EU-wide figure of 9.1%. According to the government's uh, Committee on Climate Change, greenhouse gas emissions per kilo of British beef production are approximately half the global average. These aforementioned statistics indicate that the UK is well poised on the global stage to continue strengthening trends of livestock emission reductions and carve out a blueprint for which livestock systems worldwide may use to inform their sustainable development. Our national desire to address key environmental issues started in 2008 with the introduction of the Climate Change Act 
a significant policy framework which legally binded us to achieving an 80% reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 against the 1990 baseline. Seven years later, our eager enthusiasm towards being a part of the solution to global warming was corroborated with our participation in the Paris Climate Agreement, requiring us to comply with environmental regulations and targets set by representatives of state parties outside our own borders, which goes to show just how committed we are to tackling this issue, as recent political events would suggest we're not too fond of taking orders from our neighbours. In 2019, we became the world's first major economy to legally commit to net zero carbon by 2050. An impressive stance, but one that the National Farmers Union would argue is achievable as early as 2040. Clearly then, there was a dire consensus within our government and reg relevant regulatory bodies that positive change within industries, uh, environmental outputs is absolute and the livestock sector is not exempt from these expectations. In recent years, climate research, media articles and dietary trends have made the claims that livestock farming is bad for the environment, a suggestion which the opposing team will undoubtedly base their arguments on today. We, however, will prove with relevant research that the livestock sector can meet the requirements for net zero and that the rise in awareness of livestock related climate impacts does not constitute a challenge for livestock farming, as our opposition would have you believe, but rather presents an excellent opportunity for industry giants such as McDonald's and Dawn Meats to capitalize upon these misconceptions and markedly showcase the unequivocal potential for the livestock sector to be a resounding contributor to climate mitigation efforts. Within this debate, my fellow teammates will aim to draw your attention to a range of factors paramount to our understanding of climate agriculture relations. An in-depth overview of the greenhouse gas emissions associated with livestock systems will be presented first by my fellow ex-housemate, Elizabeth Preston, whose fiery passion and stubborn stance will surely have the opposition empathising with the daily struggles I endured whilst living with her. Lindsay Haynes, an avid preacher of sustainable agriculture, will then run through some of the core technical aspects and pathways which could be adopted to alleviate the sector's output. Meanwhile, the scientific complexities underpinning carbon sequestration and similar mitigation strategies will be delivered by my good friend and insatiable meat eater, Oliver Stevens. Finally, the key socio-economic factors and potential policy opportunities embedded in future-proofing livestock systems will be addressed by myself in the closing statement. We are convinced that our case today will additionally lighten all those involved in the meat industry, both direct and indirect, and provoke thoughts of necessary change which cannot be achieved without their continued support and development. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Simon, and well done. Thank you again to Simon Longworth on behalf of Aberystwyth for his opening remarks in opposing uh, the motion. Uh, the livestock sector can meet the requirements for net zero. And now to give the opposing view is CAFRI captain Sarah Davison. Welcome, Sarah. Good morning, Chairperson, adjudicators, our esteemed judges, and to the members of the proposition from the University of Aberystwyth, Florida. My name is Sarah Davidson, and I am here today as the proud captain of the CAFRI team in the Great Agri-Food Debate 2021. We appreciate the opportunity to participate in events such as this, given the world that we are currently living in, and we are even more appreciative to be strongly opposing the motion presented to us by the University of Aberystwyth, which is that the livestock sector can meet the requirements for net zero. The CAFRI team unequivocally believe that net zero and livestock should not be used in the same sentence, let alone the same field. Dairy, beef, sheep, pigs and poultry. No, this is not the itinerary for Old MacDonald's farm, but instead the definition of the livestock sector that we are here today to debate. Producing the milk we drink, the meat we eat, and with endless byproducts enhancing our lives in many ways. Unfortunately, the concept of net zero is just not as simple as a children's nursery rhyme. The net zero requirements are the idea that we can achieve a balance between the greenhouse gases of methane, nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide that are being put into the atmosphere with those that are being removed, resulting in the additions being no more than the amount taken away. Within the UK and Ireland, the net zero requirements are being measured as a 100% reduction of greenhouse gases below the 1990 emission levels by the deadline of 2050. Emissions have already been reduced by 
with a massive reduction of 11% in 2020 alone. That's great, I hear you say. The proposition are on to a good thing. But can I just remind you of the motion that we are opposing here today, which is that the livestock sector can meet the requirements for net zero, which is an entirely different story altogether. This fantastic reduction of 11% emissions within 2020 is thought to be as a direct result of the coronavirus pandemic. Less cars on the road, less planes in the sky. Surely showing you that there are other industries that have a much bigger impact on the emissions than the livestock sector, as I don't think many farmers stopped their work over the past year. Our argument today is that not only the livestock sector cannot meet net zero requirements, but also it should not have to. To consider our opposition to the motion that the livestock sector can meet net zero requirements, my teammates will be explaining to you why this is not a realistic target for our sector by presenting a myriad of different reasons. My teammate, Wilson Marshall, a man that knows his way around a milk cow or two, will be detailing where exactly these emissions are occurring within the livestock sector and why we cannot simply start implementing the solutions I'm sure Aberitswith were put forward today without suffering the unintended consequences on food production and our family businesses. When we have considered the facts and figures about the livestock sector, our teammate Alice Heron will go forward to show why net zero should not even have been a target in the first place for the livestock sector, given the misalignment between science and policy. We have seen optimistic targets set in the past and failed in the past. Net zero is optimistic, but not realistic for the livestock sector. My third teammate, James Rolston, will take a look at the realities of implementing these so-called solutions for net zero. Reducing cattle numbers, planting more trees. These sound lovely on paper, but not so lovely for the actual farm businesses impacted, impacted by these proposed solutions. Please do not insult our livestock farmers and the years of effort they have put into working their lands and animals by proposing changes that are just a means to an end for net zero. With all this in mind, I am keen to once again remind you of Caffrey's opposition to the motion that the livestock sector can meet net zero. We do not want to be negative about the wider challenges facing us in the world, bar what is happening in our own farmyards but we urge you to all take a realistic approach to the supposedly simple and easy fix solutions that I'm yet to hear Albert Whitsworth put forward today. The livestock, meeting, the livestock sector meeting net zero is just an ask too far. So I encourage you all to oppose the motion being put forward today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Appreciate that. Uh, uh, if have we any points of information for Sarah? And again, if we have, please give your name and say point of information, and then we we'll ask your question. Oliver Stevens uh, from Aberystwyth University. Could I raise a point of information? You may indeed. Thank you. Given the assertions made at COP twenty one in twenty fifteen that by increasing soil carbon by just zero point four percent each year, we can not only offset livestock emissions but offset uh, the global fossil fuel emissions. How is it that you believe that livestock emissions cannot be seen as net zero? Now, Sarah, you have a choice of accepting that point of information or rejecting it. Thank you, Oliver, for your point of information. This figure, yes, is very positive, but we have to consider the different soil types and different varieties of land across the regions. That may be applicable for certain types of the land, but here in Northern Ireland, we have a lot of wetlands that are not suitable for these so-called solutions. And I look forward to hearing more about your arguments throughout. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver, for the question, and thank you, Sarah, for your response. So, continuing to oppose the motion, we're now going to hear from Sarah's teammate at Caffrey, Wilson Marshall. Good afternoon, chairperson, adjudicators, esteemed judges, and members of the proposition. My name is Wilson Marshall, and I would like to strongly second our opposition to the motion that the livestock sector can meet requirements for net zero. As Sarah has already alluded to, I myself am a dairy farmer from County Tyrone, and I love the black and white milkers so much that if you cut me in two, instead of losing pints of blood, 
I would lose pints of milk. <laughs> For those here who have grown up milking cows or perhaps have done some relief milking before, it's highly likely that at some stage you have been faced with the task of dealing with a batch of freshly calved heifers coming into the parlor. Step one, getting the heifers in through the door to the rear of the parlor. After 15 minutes of sweating, the heifers are stressed and there's yet to be a set of clusters cupped on. Hand shaking, you aim with that first cup. Just as the kicking starts, the cortisol kicks in and is magic. The contents of her bowels are smeared across your cheeks. But what has this got to do with the task of reaching net zero, you ask? Well, the Irish and British farmer is many things and can do many things. Business owner, mechanic, accountant, even an environmentalist operating some of the most sustainable livestock systems worldwide. But see that freshly calved batch of heifers I talked about? They are deadly, cluster-kicking, methane-emitting giants of the bovine world. And asking the poor farmer to address the rest of the heifer's environmental imperfections is a daunting task in itself. Travel a mile down the road from the parlor, and you'll meet Harry the hen man. Of a spring evening, Harry loves nothing more than getting his big swanky dung spreader out to the fields. But each fling of dung out the back of that muck spreader is like picking up a lump of the extremely potent greenhouse gas, nitrous oxide, and releasing it into the atmosphere. The same nitrous oxide that lasts within our precious atmosphere for 100 years. So proposition, try counteracting its cumulative buildup over the past century with a revolutionary manure additive. Harry the Henman is a good companion of Pat the pig farmer. Pat is faced with a major setback. Never having enough under his very intensive system. Other local farmers in the area use his pig slurry for their land. Slurry is a harmful emitter of both methane and nitrous oxide. And since the pig and poultry sectors will simply never be able to reach carbon neutrality due to the imbalance between emissions and lack of land for sequestration, is it a sustainable option for such slurry to be exported to neighboring dairy farms, for example, and hamper their ability to reach net zero? I think not. Agricultural practices account for a third of total methane emissions in the UK, with the majority of this coming from cattle and sheep as a byproduct of enteric fermentation, a natural process, might I add. With methane being 21 times more potent than CO2, it's easy to point the finger directly at the destructive ruminant source of global climate change. That is granted that the sheep-obsessed proposition don't try to pull the wool over your eyes. But Pat the Pig Farmer is friendly with Brilliant Ben, and Brilliant Ben operates a mixed beef and sheep enterprise and has recently been tracking his carbon footprint. Now, he has attempted to reduce emissions by making use of multi-species clover-rich swords, but still can't understand why he has yet to hit the ultimate net zero. Ladies and gentlemen, let me present to you the inefficiencies associated with the ruminant animal. <laughs> Teammate James later discusses the inefficiencies involved with the solutions currently being provided. Let's not forget the ruminant Ruminant animal isn't some sort of flawless, efficient machine, and that in reality, the microbiome living within the rumen is like a grand old piano that needs regular fine tuning. That leaves me back then to where I started, home. Remember that wild kicking batch of heifers I was telling you about? Well, a year has, has came and gone, and I am delighted to tell you that we have introduced yet another wild kicking batch of heifers to the herd. Much like the greenhouse gases produced from the livestock sector, the legacy of the young heifer persists. A net zero target for the livestock sector is the equivalent of me having a no kicking target for these flighty heifers. Wishful thinking. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Wilson. Uh, and we'll now ask the opposition if there are any points of information to be raised. Hi, uh, it's Lindsay Haynes here. I'd like to raise a POI. Certainly, Lindsay, and can I just remind Wilson, you have the choice of accepting this first or if there is a second, the second, but not both. So, Lindsay, away you go. 
Um, so Wilson, what happens to nitrous oxide emissions when you use slurry injectors? Thank you. Listen, uh, thanks for your point of information, Lindsay Haynes, um, and I would like to accept that. Uh, whenever slurry injectors are used, nitrous oxide emissions are reduced significantly. Um, however, they are still there within the environment and uh, nitrous oxide is emitted through acid rain, which comes as a process through volatilization in the environment. So although they are effective, they are not effective enough to reach that not net zero target. Uh, they will never get to that not net zero. Thank you. Thank you, Wilson, uh, and thank you for your contributions. So we've now heard from uh, the two opposing speakers, Sarah and Wilson from CAFRI. Uh, we'll now hear from, in, in proposing the motion, Elizabeth Preston. And just to remind you all again, the motion is the livestock sector can meet the requirements for net zero. Elizabeth, over to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Elizabeth Preston, and I am a second year agricultural student, honoured to be representing Aberystwyth University for this year's Great Agri-Food Debate. So, as my colleague Simon Longworth has already stated, I am strongly proposing the motion that the livestock sector can and will meet the requirements of net zero. Now, as a dairy farmer, Winston, I'm sure you can agree with me that at the end of the day, we just cannot stop cows from farting, which, pardon the pun, is quite simply the bottom line. But with new strategies and legislation in place, we can all work as a nation to meet net zero targets. With a recent development, only in the last week or so, Morrison's has announced it will become the first supermarket to be completely supplied by net zero British farms by 2030. Yes, that is in just a mere 10 years, falling short of the 2050 target, which Sarah mentioned in her opening statement. Waitrose also announcing it's making a similar commitment by 2035. Now, why should these large, successful retailers make such a promise if there is no backbone to the fact that net zero is achievable to the livestock sector? To lead into the science behind it all, there is ongoing research of how different greenhouse gases affect global temperatures differently over time. This all depends on how long these gases remain in the atmosphere. Methane is a relatively short-lived greenhouse gas in comparison to carbon dioxide. So, should it be treated differently? Recent research at Oxford University certainly insists on this. They contend that we should be updating policies that aim for net zero emissions of stock pollutants such as carbon dioxide and low but stable emissions of flow pollutants such as methane. Given a stable number of livestock, a cattle birth today takes the place of a cattle birth a couple of decades ago and does not increase the total level of methane in the atmosphere. Whereas carbon dioxide emitted from a car today may still be around in the atmosphere when we reach the third millennium, when Irish fans may finally have forgiven Warren Gatland for dropping by an O'Driscoll. It is obvious that there is no single answer to the problem. But with the National Farmers Union setting out three broad aspects of the job, it is clear and understandable for the farmer to reach net zero. These being improving farming's productive efficiency, improving land management and changing land use to capture carbon, and boosting renewable energy and the wider bioeconomy. So, ladies and gentlemen, agriculture is a key piece to the puzzle when reaching net zero. It is unique in that the industry can act as a carbon sink by capturing carbon dioxide in the air and turn it, with the help of farmers, into a wide range of food, fuels and fibres. 
It is important to note that this has never been more crucial as the world needs to find more sustainable ways of producing more food for an ever increasing population. The next step for agriculture is for the government and other stakeholders to support the industry in bringing net zero to life for the farmers and growers who are critical to its success. So to briefly con conclude, ladies and gentlemen, I am firmly standing by our farmers and agreeing that net zero in this industry can and will be achieved. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Well done. Uh, have we any points of information for Elizabeth, please? Yeah, can I just interject on uh, Elizabeth's and offer a point of information there, please, Paul? Certainly, yeah. Uh, go ahead, Wilson. Elizabeth, you chatted about some uh, brilliant ongoing research uh, at Oxford University, but may I point out that uh, in a study done by Professor Frank Hauser of Oxford, Oxford University, that even if all of these um, strategies are employed, there, there will still be a three degrees increase by the end of the century. Um, so I just wonder um, what you think the main um, strategies and and uh, methods to reduce emissions actually are. So Elizabeth, do you want to accept that or not? Uh, thank you, Wilson. Um, I'll accept your uh, point of information. Um, I think the main thing to state here is improving efficiency. It is a known fact, even researchers at Oxford University, that methane doesn't last as long as other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So precision agricultural techniques, which will improve efficiency of these systems, is ultimately the answer to all the problems. Thank you very much for that, Elizabeth. Uh, so as we reach the halfway stage, uh, it is my pleasure now to welcome opposing the motion from Caffrey, Alice Herron. Good afternoon. In the words of Eisenhower, farming looks mighty easy when your plow is a pencil and you are thousands of miles from the field. And with the greatest respect to any of our judges here today who have been involved with policy making, it can sometimes be like those who are most responsible for directing our sector are not thinking ahead to the unintended consequences. Policy needs to be based on sound science, but also taking into consideration the practice of good farming techniques and husbandry. The arguments set forward here today by both the proposition and opposition have been full of facts and statistics for both sides of the argument and necessity when discussing the likelihood of meeting a target as the net, as like the net zero requirement. However, there are mounting discrepancies with how the emissions are calculated and how these facts and statistics are obtained. The differences between how emissions are measured and calculated using emissions calculators are astonishing, making it easy to find one to suit your case, such as painting the livestock sector in a, in a negative light or <laughs> Elizabeth's argument using these calculators favorably to make big claims about big retailers. Within many methodologies, used to calculate carbon footprints on farms, there are many components which emit carbon dioxide that are not included in the total figure. Examples include land cultivation, fertilizer and meal manufacture, the tires on our tractors and concrete for our laneways and milking parlors. Current calculations are simply incorrect, rendering the ro reduction roadmaps for the livestock sectors flawed. As any good farmer knows, if you can't, if you can't measure it, then don't, you can't manage it. Before we in the livestock sector can even begin to think about starting to manage our emissions, not only what is being emitted needs to be accurately and consistently measured, but also what the impact that these supposed solutions from Aberystwyth are actually sequestering. If policy forces farmers to attempt to reach such real unrealistic targets on the basis of information that is out of date or else not relevant to the time of implementation, surely that's a waste of time. Bioeconomic models based on scenarios and what ifs from land data sets for little to no relevance in the field conditions. We can control what we put into a computer, but we cannot control the rainfall, soil temperature, and the, and the extreme weather events that our livestock sector are subject to annually. If, and it's a big if, we are actually measuring emissions effectively, 
then perhaps a more realistic target can be set than the one size fits all of this net zero. How can the same target be applied across regions with vastly different livestock systems, land and weather? We already set different production and financial benchmarks on farms on different quality of land. So how is it fair to assume that every farm is able to meet the same targets in relation to net zero? I appreciate we are painting a very negative picture here today, but we are wary given many optimistic targets that have spectacularly failed in the past. An example is the introduction of soil sampling in the 1970s to combat rising levels of phosphorus in our soils. So what has been the outcome of this supposed solution? Well, after investment of millions of pounds and years of time to research, develop and implement, the phosphorus situation is no better. Please appreciate the reluctance of the livestock sector to try to understand, implement and see results from net zero solutions given that this seems to be a situation of being there done that. So how will our policy makers encourage an uptake of implementing change and go about trying to encourage farmers to change the farming practices that they have followed their entire lives? Well, of course, another financial incentive. Farmers take any opportunity of a good handout. And currently, £3 million pounds used within Northern Ireland for agriculture incentives alone and payment schemes. What, but this is just a drop in the ocean for what is needed to be spent. One trillion pounds within the United Kingdom. Can this be afforded, particularly after the previous year having to cope with the COVID pandemic and Brexit? Coming from a beef and sheep background myself, I do not want to change years of breeding stock, land management and hard work for the mere promise of a payment. Without the full involvement of farmers, it's like having a ball and match day without the players. If a change is to happen, not only is financial help required, but also technical support. As my teammate Wilson stated, farmers are many things and there's just not enough time in the day to add another job title to this ever growing list. Often policy tells us the what to do, but not how to achieve it. We can and do appreciate the activities being carried out to try to start working towards net zero. But in return, please appreciate that unless policies are implemented that are based <laughs> Thank you very much, Alice. Thank you. Um, I, I just wonder if we have any points of information for Alice, please. Could I uh, raise a point of information, please? It's Oliver Stevens from Aberystwyth University. Thank you, Oliver. Um, you mentioned all these outlandish calculations regarding emissions. However, is it not the case that most reports overestimate the emissions from agriculture, such as the FAO report that titled Livestock's Long Shadow, which drastically overestimated agriculture's emissions? Would you like to answer that or pass, Alice? Can you repeat the question, please? Just there's a bit of jitter. Um, so you mentioned all these outlandish calculations uh, regarding livestock emissions. However, is it not the case that most reports overestimate the emissions of agriculture, such as the FAO with their report Livestock's Long Shadow, which drastically overestimated livestock's emissions? Uh, thank you. I'll accept that. Um, yes, it may seem that they're overestimating, but they're not. As I stated in my speech, there's a lot of measures that are missing. So you're not actually calculating the full calculation. So uh, it's very inconsistent between all calculations. So it needs to um, be consistent and include everything in it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, for Oliver, for the question. And indeed, Alice, for your answer. Lindsay Haynes, can it? Hello, I'm Lindsay Haynes and I'm studying agriculture with animal science at Aberystwyth University. As my teammate Elizabeth just said, we can't stop cows from farting, but I'm here to tell you that we can stop them from burping. According to the FAO, enteric fermentation takes up 44.3% of global livestock emissions. So a reduction in this figure would have a massive impact on livestock's emissions. Within the rumen is a type of microbe called a methanogen, which takes sole responsibility for producing methane. By stopping methanogens from being present, the enteric fermentation emissions are drastically reduced. A recent Australian paper found that we can greatly decrease the burping emissions by using red seaweed. 
Feeding only 0.2% of a cow's diet as red seaweed, we can decrease greenhouse gas emissions by a whopping 98% whilst making feed conversions more efficient, which would nearly half all global livestock emissions. Yes, you heard me right. That is nearly half global livestock emissions simply wiped out by using a little seaweed. Now that we all know how to get cow butt smelling like roses, we can focus on how we manage what comes out of the other end. Manure management accounts for 10% of livestock emissions. And whilst there's lots of black and white dots on the rolling hills of, U of the UK and Ireland, we also have animals in barns. There is a leading innovation company in the Netherlands which specialises in taking advantage of emissions and manure into valuable fertilisers. This system has the potential to be useful across all housed livestock systems. This Netherlands-based system separates urine from dung and then filters the emissions from manure and urine, converting 10 to 20 kilos of nitrogen per cow per year. It also reduces ammonium emissions by 70% when compared to standard barns. So not only can farmers decrease their barn greenhouse gas emissions by 70%, but they are also producing their own fertilisers. This is a crucial point, as every single tonne of nitrogen fertiliser produced in Europe produces around 8 tonnes of CO2. This means that livestock manure can be used as a weapon against climate change and not a problem. So why not make your own, increase efficiency and reduce emissions? There are other commonly used innovations such as using slurry covers which decreases slurry emissions by 80%, a relatively cheap option which any farmer with a manure storage can implement. There are numerous new methods that have been implemented within livestock farming already, but one of the innovation that we at Aberystwyth University have been leading the way on is the, de de is the development of high sugar grasses. Our high sugar grasses were the top three grasses sown in the UK and Ireland last year. These grasses greatly reduce nitrogen losses from grazing animals and crucially, they significantly reduce the emissions of nitrous oxide, which is a key greenhouse gas. Increasing efficiency with all livestock types enables us to get more for less and really makes consumers say, I'm loving it. Overall, there is work to be done to ensure the farmers meet the NFU target of being carbon neutral by 2040. But with these new innovations rapidly coming out to combat emissions, we can become net zero whilst increasing the efficiency of our farms. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so my name's James Wall and I have a point of information, please. Um, Lindsay, um, you were talking about red seed weeds there. Well, they aren't commonly grown sort of in this UK area. It's mainly brown seaweed. So, uh, and brown seaweed just doesn't, it, it would have the same impact on uh, methane emissions. A Chuggish, Chuggish researcher, Sinead Waters, said that um, uh, livestock uh, recently stated that red seaweed was not a viable option as brown seaweed will only improve um, animal health and performance and have no other impacts. So, Lindsay, I guess the question is to you, how can you work with this if it isn't around? Um, so, we believe that uh, we can use hydroponic systems uh, and implement uh, using manure to grow the seaweed and then put it straight back into the diet, uh, which seems like a very easy alternative. And all we would have to do is import the initial red seaweed and then be able to grow it from home in any farm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Uh, appreciate that. And thanks, James, for your questions. My, how time flies when we're enjoying ourselves. Hard to believe, but we're down now to the last two speakers representing Caffrey and Aberystwyth before we hear the concluding remarks from the captains. So in that line, I'd ask James, James Rolston uh, uh, opposing the motion for Caffrey, which of course is the livestock sector can meet the requirements for net zero to take the stage. James, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Eldridge Cleaver, the American author and political activist said, you can either be part of the solution or you're part of the problem. When discussing the net zero target, the livestock sector seems to fall into both parties, the problem, but also the solution. As discussed by our proposition, there are many prospective so-called solutions to net zero that the livestock sector can implement. 
However, it's time for a dose of realism and to cement why the livestock sector, much like Wales' recent Grand Slam hopes, will fall short of meeting net zero. New technologies are being implemented, as mentioned by Elizabeth on the opposing team. These, uh, these implements can improve the... and improve the efficiency and viability of farms. However, the latter is only approved when emissions are recorded per unit of product produced. On the other hand, our carbon footprints are measured in terms of absolute emissions. A far cry from net zero. Land is a finite resource, so using it to plant trees and multi-species swords could actually cause a reduction in carbon efficiency within the livestock sector. Reducing stocking capacity and forcing animals to graze poorer quality land, heightening the risks of soil poaching and carbon release. It would be simply robbing Peter to pay Paul. Another such example of this proposed introduction of a carbon trading scheme. Is it really sustainable long term to allow any farm, food company or food consumer to intensively emit carbon but have a get out of free geo card by trading off that pollution to another region? And how about another land management technique by using the wonders of peat? As 20% of the land in Northern Ireland, 17% in the Republic, and 12% of the UK overall is peatland, that should make it easy to sequester carbon. Well, unfortunately, much like Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy, the notion that peat sequesters carbon is another myth, unless it's re-wet. Yes, you heard that right. Let's re-wet 20% of the land in Northern Ireland and similar levels in the rest of the UK and Ireland to sequester carbon. Even when peatland is re-wet, yes, carbon emissions, dioxide emissions are stopped, However, a study at the University of Rostock found that this process triggers the release of methane from the re-wet re land, a far more potent greenhouse gas. So before the talk of re-wetting ground leaves a bad taste in your mouth, let's move away from land management and towards the real culprits of the livestock sector, our ruminants. You would think that incentives for the environment would go hand in hand with animal welfare. However, animals housed indoors on intensive systems produce less emissions than animals out grazing. So what would our consumers prefer? Food produced in a manner that is, that is intensive, housed but lower emitting, or food produced in a manner that meets the animal welfare standards that our consumers expect. You cannot have your cake and eat it. What's best for the environment does not go hand in hand with animal welfare and rural communities. Sustainability is a key factor that we must consider in anything that we do to ensure we're going to continue our reputation of producing a high volume of high quality food. With a growing world population, we cannot afford to make drastic changes to our farming methods that could harm production levels or our consumers' perception of the livestock sector that we have worked so hard to grow and maintain. Reducing consumption of livestock products by 20% per capita is another suggested solution to reduce emissions from the sector. How about instead of encouraging reduced consumption of these nutritious foods produced to the highest standards, we encourage the public to reduce their household food waste. A UN study shows that this accounts for 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Instead of reducing how much they consume, actually consume what you purchase. And let's see what a difference that makes to emissions. It seems to have been forgotten throughout all of this is that livestock farming is a business. What other business would be asked to revolutionize their way of working and upheave the very ground they stand on? Why then should the livestock farming be expected to do so? After all, business functions best with less business and more business in government. Making extreme and drastic changes to our currently carefully planned and executed farming practices does not sound like a solution to the problem. If we look at the list of financial and social impacts, we see that our rural communities will bear the weight of the sacrifice and it may threaten their existence entirely. We must be realistic about what can be achieved. While the livestock sector has its part to play in the fight against carbon emissions, net zero is not achievable. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Well done. Uh, have we any points of information for James? And can I remind you again, if you have, give your name first, please. Anthony Evis with a point of information. Good afternoon, Anthony. We'd be delighted to hear it, please. So I just wanted to say that Austell and others in 2019 estimated that peatlands, which are from uh, which are a form of wetlands, store over 550 megatons of carbon in Great Britain. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the beginning, maybe, or maybe James oh. did. Was that a statement or have you a question? It, it was It was a statement. Okay, James, do you wish to respond or to pass? Uh, can I pass that one, please? 
Indeed you can. Do we have a second point of information for James? We are entitled to put two up and accept uh, one. Lindsay Haynes, point of information. Yes, please, Lindsay. Um, so Terra et al. 2021 published yesterday uh, to point out that grasslands will sequester consistently under future climate. So how could you possibly dispute this? Uh, thank you for your point of information, Lindsay. Um, there's only so much grassland in the world to be able to sequester carbon and at the rate we're emitting and the new technologies that you speak of, uh, the best that I can see only a handful can do over 70% reduction. So it's a long way off net zero and I don't think we're going to reach it within the time frame. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, uh, Lindsay, and thanks for your response, James. So before getting to our closing remarks from both captains, Sarah and Simon, it's my pleasure now to introduce our last speaker, and that is Oliver Stevens uh, from Aberystwyth. And Oliver is proposing the motion, the, the livestock sector can meet the requirements for net zero. Oliver, over to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, as our chair, Simon introduced earlier, and Paul has just introduced, I'm Oliver, a second year agricultural BSc student at Aberystwyth University. We've heard so far a lot of ways to reduce emissions produced from livestock, which is key for achieving net zero. I will tell you now that despite the opposition's baseless totes, that carbon sequestration uh, basis uh, arguments, carbon, carbon sequestration is yet another key that opens the door not only to net zero production, but offsetting the world's carbon emissions. At COP21 in 2015, the concept of four per 1000 was introduced. This is the concept that by introduce, increasing the soil organic carbon of all agricultural soils by just 0.4% every year, the total sequestered carbon would not only offset livestock emissions, but offset the equivalent of all annual global fossil fuel emissions. So in response to the assertion made earlier by the opposition, and I quote, there is only so much grassland in the world, the grassland that we do have is more than sufficient for offsetting livestock production. This speaks to the power of, that soils have in sequestrating carbon and that by increasing soil organic matter, we can uh, play a vital role in negating climate change. So how do we increase soil organic matter? Well, application of livestock manure, maintaining permanent grassland, incorporation of biochar, avoiding fallow land, adding grass lays into an arable rotation. Do I need to go on? The take home from all of these ways to put carbon back out of our fragile atmosphere and into our soil is that livestock production plays a pivotal role, be it through the manure from poultry, swine and ruminants, the land they graze on or the material they are bedded with. Livestock production enables us to manage our soils in a way that will see us increasing our soil organic carbon by four per 1000. In 2016, a leading team of scientists from across the UK found that 60% of the UK's current stored carbon is in its grassland. All of this carbon is stored in the top metre of the soil and so critically vulnerable to cultivation, to the extent that arable, arable cultivations can volatilise this carbon. So maintaining grassland is the key to keeping our soil carbon in our soil. Livestock production enables this while offsetting livestock emissions to achieve net zero. The beauty of storing carbon under grassland is that it is safe and the land is still productive. The opposition has told you and you hear in the media all the time that planting trees is the best way to store carbon, but this is simply untrue. A paper published yesterday in the Journal of Nature by Terra et al highlighted that the soil beneath our forests sequests such a small amount of carbon that it has no significant impact on climate change, whereas soil under grassland sequests such a large amount of carbon that it has, it has a vital role in climate change. And before, the, and before the opposition helpfully mentions that carbon stored in trees, carbon is stored in trees, I should inform you on the findings published in the same journal in 2013, showing that stem volume of European trees in forests is decreasing over time and thus carbon sequestration potential is decreasing. Adding to this, carbon is re-released into the atmosphere from trees through wildfires and man-made deforestation. Um, therefore, storing carbon in trees is not a reliable option. 
And in response to the uh, point made by the opposition earlier, yes, I agree. There is a vast amount of wetland soil in the UK and Ireland. And this offer, but this offers yet another glistening opportunity for livestock production. It enables the sequestration of great amounts of carbon while still producing a valuable feed source for small ruminants through extensive grazing. School just posted this morning showed scenes of deforestation in the Kilda Forest in Northumberland being done in the name of sustainability, converting the poor carbon store of the forest into a wealth of wetland, which is anticipated to sequester more than four times as much carbon as the woodland will, with the additional benefit of being available for grazing. The importance of grazed wetlands is evident, with Canary et al in 2010 going so far as to label wetlands a vital terrestrial carbon store. By now you should see the importance and opportunity of the livestock sector to utilise its natural resources and byproducts to catch carbon and not only be carbon neutral but to make a real difference in our globe, global fight against climate change. Thank you very much for listening. So thank you very much for that Oliver. Um, we now ask for points of information and certainly Oliver was not shy about throwing plenty of them in himself. So I believe we have one from backstage. Please, if you give your name and uh, ask your question or give us your information, please. I am Joanne Moore representing CAFRI today and I have a point of information. The limitations include continuous degra degrading of grasslands, changing climate. Could the proposition please tell me how the Northern Ireland livestock farmer who is farming on wet ground is meant to sequester carbon and and then can graze livestock on and f without poaching the ground. Do you wish to take that Oliver? Thank you very much Joanne. I, I accept that point of order and I would like to reply that as I referenced Terra et al has identified uh, along with uh, Karayan et al in 2010 that wetland is a vital sequester it vitally sequests carbon and the livestock farmer in Northern Ireland does not need to do anything that naturally occurs. In regard to how they graze the soil, um, gen standard uh, livestock practices still apply, not overstocking the soil and maintaining good soil structure is still as relevant as ever. There is no additional input required. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we come now to the closing remarks from our two captains. And we're going to start with the opposition captain, Sarah Davison from Caffrey. Sarah, over to you. Chairperson, adjudicators, judges and members of the proposition. For the final time today, can I remind you of Caffrey's opposition to the motion that the livestock sector can meet the requirements for net zero. Just like match day, wheels have came to the debate filled with enthusiasm and ready to fight their cause. But can we, we as the opposition, must hold up the red card and stop them in their tracks to net zero? I commend Aberwit Swift for carrying out research on today's topic, but I suggest our proposition take their heads out of the NFU leaflet on climate, climate friendly farming. We are here today to debate the motion that the livestock sector can meet net zero, not the environment. Personally, it feels like to me two different motions have been discussed today. The proposition even said so themselves in their first argument. There is no distinct answer to the question. Elizabeth, you mentioned Morrison's target to reach net zero by 2030. But can I make everyone aware that Morrison's are supplied by 3,000 farms, which is only a mere percentage of over 109,000 farms across the UK. If you're going to come to a debate, at least make sure you bring an argument that includes the whole industry. Elizabeth and Lindsay, you both mentioned technologies. Yes, yes, it's out there. However, the impact they have are minimal and science is only touching the tip of the iceberg as they are only being released, never mind implemented into everyday farming. To improve efficiency, you commented on, you need evidence, which is just not there. Oliver, you said Northern Ireland already has the resources to, to supplement net carbon. So, why, do we not, why are we not already achieving net zero if we don't need any additional inputs? Can we ask the proposition to take off their daffodil tinted glasses and see that the solutions that they have put forward may have their place in contributing to net zero, but the place is not within the livestock se sector? As we will all remember Wilson mentioning before, Oxford University's Professor Sam Hockhauser 
has stated that the current measures are simply too little, too late. The livestock sector has other priorities, bar meeting net zero. We need the sector to focus on the production of nutritious, high quality foodstuffs for today's generation and future generations. If we were forced to reduce numbers, it would risk offshoring agri-food production for that of overseas nations. How does that sound to a nation who increased production to step up to the challenges of world war and potato famine? I'm sure that Wales' most famous farmer, Gareth Wynne-Jones, would have something to say about that, as well as Harriet in the judging panel, who is well aware of the challenges ensuring a steady, high-quality supply of raw materials. How will starting to feed seaweed affect production rates? Again, yet another study that is yet to have reliable evidence. If I order a Big Mac, I want it to taste like a Big Mac, not a fillet of fish. As agricultural students looking to the future, my teammates and I are well aware of the responsibilities of the agri-food industry resting upon our shoulders. And we are not ignorant to the contribution that the industry makes towards greenhouse gases and the need for a net zero target. But surely I am not alone in my confusion at the proposition's solution to import enough seaweed for nearly 10 million cattle across the UK. Let's not forget the emissions released through importation. Don Meats themselves recently signed a low carbon pledge, but note it is called low carbon, not no carbon. In the blind panic to reach net zero, we do not want to suffer the unintended consequences of a trade-off between food security, health, child development, clean air and water. Despite the requirements for net zero meeting the target, the 2050 target, 29 years from now, proposed solutions still strike as a quick fix and will not help to deliver long-term sustainable reductions. The actions needed to reduce emissions is not just a sector or even a national task, it is a global task. The overriding limitation of the livestock sector meeting net zero is time. Time will tell if net zero can be achieved and time is a precious resource that we have a very limited amount of. The countdown is on to 2050. Thank you. Well done, Sarah, and thank you very much for that. Uh, as you know, there are no points of information for closing remarks, so that allows us to move swiftly along to the final contribution for today's debate. And that comes from Simon Longworth of Aberystwyth, who, of course, opened the proceedings. So Simon uh, is uh, speaking in proposition of the motion, which I'm going to say for nearly the last time today, of course, is the livestock sector can meet the requirement of net zero. Uh, over to you, Simon. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, in today's debate, my fellow teammates have delivered a clear and concise argument for the livestock industry undoubtedly being capable of meeting net zero requirements. Each of them has substantiated their arguments with both scientific basis and admirable passion for the subject. But if you still have doubts about our proposal, then perhaps allow me to once more draw your attention to the National Farmers Union, a long-standing union for British farmers who have asserted that net zero targets are achievable by 2040, 10 years sooner than the timeline we are proposing today. This goes in complete contrast to the opposition's early points that the deadline of 2050 is unrealistic for farmers. Why would the NFU, the most successful representation body for agriculture and horticulture in England and Wales, and pioneers of protecting the best interests of our nation's farmers, so strongly support the claim that net zero farming was achievable by 2040 if they didn't believe it was possible? Moreover, the opposition's anecdotal claims earlier that the dairy sector cannot meet the requirements for net zero simply don't add Why would Arla Foods and its 10,300 farm owners set their own targets of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 30% per kilo of milk over the next decade and steadily work towards carbon net zero by 2050, unless they fully understood all aspects re required by them to achieve these goals? I'm not sure about you, but I would bet my money on the largest dairy company in the UK knowing what they are talking about. The positive indirect effects that livestock farming has, as mentioned by my teammate Oliver Stevens, highlights the need for preserving and enhancing grazing pastures for increased carbon sequestration and sheds light on the additional roles that optimised livestock farming has for boosting land management strategies. Meanwhile, the plethora of innovations and methods appraised by Lindsay Haynes clearly demonstrates the versatility of option-based solutions available enabling livestock farmers with different needs in different regions to adopt the most well-suited methods to their farms. We've expressed the array of options available to farmers to assist them in achieving net zero, but what about the financial side of things? 
Building upon Elizabeth's calls earlier for government and stakeholder intervention to help support farmers, there is a clear pathway for how this might be achieved. Given the UK's withdrawal from the European Union and subsequent participation in the common agricultural policy, there is a unique opportunity here for the revisal of schemes proposed as part of a post-cap support, which may be fine-tuned to establish a strong linkage between climate change mitigation strategies and future support payments. Essentially, this would allow governments to directly incentivize carbon sequestration and emission reduction strategies within the livestock industry. Such market-based mechanisms we are proposing here have the significant advantage as well in that the reliance on public funds to deliver these actions will be very small, perhaps even none. As Helm 2017 highlights, the monies released from the CAP scheme could be used to orchestrate a new architecture of subsidies aimed at rewarding and supporting farmers who adopt climate mitigation strategies within their livestock holdings. The benefits to farmers, however, does not even stop there. A 2020 report prepared for the Climate Change Committee on the economic impacts of net zero land use scenarios found there were multiple social benefits and cost saving opportunities for farmers alike when low carbon agricultural methods and technologies had been implemented. Specifically relevant to farmers, an estimated £322 per head of livestock was generated under scenarios where low carbon practices for the purposes of meeting net zero requirements had been adopted. As for the wider society, investment in low carbon strategies within the livestock sector for the purposes of meeting net zero created both market and non-market benefits for the public, approximated to be worth £8.3 billion. Whilst adoption of low carbon technologies accrued the largest private benefits for farmers out of all 15 net zero land use options being investigated, calculated at £7.5 billion. Meanwhile, the initial private investment cost of transitioning to net zero livestock was estimated to only be £1.9 billion, meaning an estimated £5.4 billion profit, private profit for farmers. It looks as though zero carbon livestock isn't as disastrous for farming communities as the opposition would have you believe. In essence, then, we are absolutely convinced that the livestock industry can achieve net zero by 2050. The evidence of environmental, social and economic benefits accrued through achieving net zero status is irrefutable. There are numerous challenges to overcome, admittedly, but with the innovations discussed here today, we believe with 100% certainty that this goal is achievable. A big thank you to the sponsors for hosting today's event and to our opponents for a thoroughly enjoyable debate. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Simon, uh, and well done to everybody concerned. Uh, that, if you like, uh, wraps up the debate uh, side of things. Of course, our judges now have to put the finishing touches to their results, uh, and we'll all be waiting, uh, of course, anxiously to see how that goes. Um, all that remains for me to do at this stage is to thank uh, everybody, and uh, can I firstly thank uh, the competing teams today, Aberystwyth and, of course, Caffrey, for a fantastic uh, piece of action. Uh, there's no doubt that there's been great, it's evidence that there's been great preparation for this, both out front and with the backroom team or backstage team and indeed the mentors. So I suppose that gives credence to the saying that there is really no I in team. So well done to you one and all. And I was particularly stuck, struck uh, by the respect shown to both teams and that's fantastic. Um, I'd also of course like to thank uh, McDonald's and Dawn Meats for uh, this initiative, which of course is supporting business leaders of the future. And I think everybody will agree with me that what we've heard today uh, can give us all comforts, uh, if you like, as custodians of our business, that the future is indeed in safe hands. So thank you and well done to everybody. I'd also just on my own behalf like to thank the organizers. I've seen a fair bit of the work that's gone on uh, in the back room in, in the organizational side of this. Uh, and there's a saying in a prayer, blessed art thou amongst women. And certainly uh, that has happened for me because I'd like to thank Jill and Helen uh, and Fran and Leanne for all the help they've given me to, to look kind of in control of what I'm doing. So thank you to all of you guys also. And uh, can I wish you all well in your chosen careers. Uh, you've prepared well today. I hope you've enjoyed the experience and I hope that you benefit from it in the future. And remember that everybody taking part in this event is indeed a winner. So thank you very much and uh, look forward to letting you know the results in due course. Thank you.